Okay, hello everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar. Um, so, uh, yeah, first of all, I will give an introduction about Dash, uh, and after that, I will introduce the speaker of today, Anna Bojoli. Uh, and um, yeah, so I can use the slides. Yes, okay. So first of all, this webinar is uh, uh, organized by DESH, the Data Science Center in Health, which is a program in the UMCD, uh, and the aim is to embed data science in the DNA of uh, the UMCD. So the vision is for, for us as DESH members to, for the UMCD to be an international leader in data-driven healthcare innovation. And as you all know, uh, there are many opportunities and many uh, possibilities to use data and technology in healthcare. And on the other hand, there are also many challenges currently in healthcare with the lack of staff, high workloads, and also a high cost and increasing number of chronic disease patients. And we think with technology, AI, uh, and e-health, we can um, yeah, improve healthcare. So data-driven innovation contributes to our goal of building the future of health and has the potential to transform healthcare. So it's not only adding AI or adding an application or adding a smart device to a patient, but it's also to really look at the uh, current healthcare processes and redesign them in order to um, yeah, make sure that we have sustainable and good healthcare now, but also in the future. And we do quite a lot, as you can see on this slide. Is the sound very bad? Can you hear me? Or is it too... Uh... Okay. So we do quite a lot. We have, uh, of course, uh, webinars like this one. Uh, we do uh, education, uh, machine learning, cohort data, uh, clinical application of uh, AI, but also uh, e-health and machine learning. So there's a lot, and you can also visit our website for more information. So these are the four uh, experts leading the way, as it says, on different fields. We have all different uh, type of uh, expertise. Um, so today, uh, Anne Beaujolie will be speaking about, um, I get my notes here. She holds the Aletta Jacobs, Jacobs Chair of Knowledge Infrastructures of the University of Groningen is the director of the Data Research Center at Campus Friesland, which is part of the University of Groningen. Um, and um, she is an expert on technological and sociological aspects of sustainability and big data, the importance of images and interfaces for the creation and circulation of knowledge plays an essential role in her work. work. Today, she's going to talk about uh, interfaces and I looked it up in the Cambridge Dictionary. So what is an interface? Uh, interfaces are connections between two pieces of electronic equipment or between a person and a computer. Well, if you look at this definition, an interface is just a piece of equipment, right? Uh, Professor Bojoli Bo will explain today what will happen if we consider interfaces as an important space of action that can influence what we do and also how we can use it uh, to um, use our data. So um, welcome, uh, Professor Anne Bojoli. You can uh, start the presentation now. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Esther. I'm going to uh, share my slides. Yeah, you can ask questions right during the presentation. Yes, absolutely. I've uh, set up uh, for things to be a little bit interactive and there's definitely time uh, to uh, have interaction. Yeah, good that you mentioned that. Okay, so sometimes it takes a little second to start up. Um, yes, all right. So here we are. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, the introduction, Esther, and uh, thank you, Femke van der Bijf, for the help in preparing uh, this webinar and to Frank Schwer for making the link, uh, because I am not working in the health domain, uh, but I think that uh, I am working on some questions that um, overlap with some of the concerns that Esther just uh, set out. 
So as I said, I uh, look forward to uh, having an interactive session. Um, Esther already mentioned uh, some of the things I do. Um, maybe good to see, to look at the bottom. Uh, that is how you can find me either uh, via email or Twitter. Uh, and I'm always happy to hear uh, from you. So today uh, I have uh, prepared my talk in five uh, fairly separate uh, parts. I think that is a bit nicer for the online participants to have clear uh, kind of uh, waves to keep uh, your attention. Um, and it's also nicer for me to break it up and have some interaction in between. So then I have uh, less the feeling that I'm talking to my screen for uh, 40 minutes. So I am uh, very excited today because this is brand new work. This is uh, the very first chapter that I am preparing for uh, my new book. Uh, so it's, uh, it's hot off the press. Um, and I want to start by sharing with you some of the urgency that I feel why I want to tackle the specific set of questions uh, that I address today why in tackling these bigger questions, interfaces are a good place to start. Um, I will then go into uh, you know, my definition of interfaces. So Esther already uh, uh, pointed to the importance of that for the whole discussion today. And then I will look at what it better interfaces could mean in the area of climate and biodiversity. So to illustrate, to make more concrete what that means, a better interface. and. Uh, We'll end with some ideas about how we might move forward on this uh, search for better interfaces. So let me start with a few quite uh, well-known uh, figures. This one is from the IPES, um, so when it comes to biodiversity, uh, but also climate change and soil degradation, we have a lot of data on this, and we've had a lot of data for some decades now. So we have uh, documented uh, these issues here. Uh, this one's from biodiversity, but also, for example, climate change. Um, we've documented what's going on. We've made predictions. We've also uh, done a lot of work in uh, forecasting or uh, giving a sense of the risks or the probabilities or the future scenarios, uh, all kinds of predictions that come from the data that's been collected. Um, and here we can see by this comparison of the, the famous burning embers uh, from 2001, 2007, that things are getting worse. Uh, soil degradation, another important uh, issue. Um, and together with colleagues, I really tried to uh, highlight that there's really a need to show that we're in danger of going beyond uh, specific boundaries of the Earth system. So, all of this uh, has given me the feeling that, um, yes, we can keep producing data, uh, making measurements, monitoring, and alerting the world. Um, but increasingly, I've been feeling that that is not enough. So it's not enough to have good data and to present it well. Um, and one of the ways I've formulated this uh, is as follows. Um, I don't want to be an accountant of death. I don't want to keep uh, keeping track of uh, how badly uh, things are going. And this is not my phrase. Um, I think I got it from Esther Turnhout from the University of Twente. Um, but as a researcher, I feel that um, we uh, need to do more than keep track of how bad things are going and um, to uh, radically rethink what we are doing with data. So that is really you know, the bigger project on which I have uh, embarked since I joined uh, Campus Friesland. And what I'm presenting today is part of a larger project, a uh, larger program of research on knowledge infrastructures for livable futures. And together with my colleagues, uh, we want to intervene in knowledge infrastructures. We want to understand them, critique them, develop them, and connect to them so that uh, we can address these urgent issues that I just signaled a minute ago. Now, this is a job, a big challenge, uh, and it's best done in collaboration with people who have expertise on knowledge infrastructures, with people who have expertise on visualization and interfaces, um, and also uh, with 
experts on these specific issues. And in our group, uh, we've decided to tackle biodiversity and climate change as two core areas where we want to, uh, to help develop better knowledge infrastructures. Now, I realize this is quite uh, an engaged way of doing science, uh, maybe even an activist uh, approach to it. Uh, so I'm curious whether you already have some reactions to this program of work um, and whether you're curious how you get from data uh, to these big questions to uh, doing this kind of science. So if you have a, a question or reaction, I'd love to hear from you either in the chat or um, uh, I'm not sure if participants can turn on uh, their mics, but uh, feel free to uh, react. Yeah, I think they can turn on their mics and also the cameras. Right. Also the chat box is uh, available. Okay, so it may be that I wasn't nearly as provocative as I thought uh, I was being, or uh, maybe people are just uh, very curious to hear what I have to say next. Okay, well, in a couple of minutes, we'll have another round, uh, and I look forward to your reactions. Okay, so um, interfaces as a starting point, and this is where we get into uh, defining interfaces. So here um, I've got three main components of what I consider to be interfaces and the different colors are meant to evoke um, that each of these elements is a complex one. So, you know, it's kind of a, a very layered and heterogeneous uh, uh, concept. And uh, this is my uh, very pared down formulation of what is an interface. So it's an organized space of uh, interaction between a system and an agent. And basically, um, an interface is a mediating structure that supports behaviors and tasks. So you see uh, on the right uh, bottom corner, you see kind of the, the archetypal or maybe the stereotypical uh, thing we think of when we say the word interface. Uh, but I want to stress that this can also be between uh, two uh, technical entities, so it doesn't have to be a human computer interface, but it can also be um, a search engine website, for example. Um, and I also want to stress that an interface is not a device. Okay? It's an organized space of interaction. So the element of practice of what you do with an interface is very much at the forefront of how I think about interfaces. So if we think further about what uh, interfaces do, the work that interfaces do, um, a common distinction is between uh, the work that they do to show and the work that they enable, enable us to do. So interfaces uh, show, so they present the intellectual structure of sites or databases. And uh, it really, that's really more kind of the, the window uh, view of what an interface is. So you can think of lists or graphics or maps. Those are different forms of uh, design of interfaces in terms of their function to show. If you think about the second uh, type, uh, what we use interfaces to do, then uh, we see that interfaces provide a set of instructions for actions and behaviors um, by offering labels for tasks. And then you can think about search, browse, zoom, login, and so on. And of course, increasingly with uh, very sophisticated digital interfaces, sometimes these two functions of showing and doing are actually very, very close uh, and, and almost indistinguishable. So you will have interactive maps, for example, which are both showing, but also enable you, enabling you to do. So those uh, two functions are not always completely separable. So, um, I, I wanted to stress that uh, interfaces are complex, but I also want to uh, share with you that interfaces are changeable. And a good way to do this is to look back a little bit in time to look at some historical images. And I know there's at least one historian uh, in the room today. So here we see uh, 
a uh, one one of the original instances of the mouse. So uh, here uh, in a little wooden box with the uh, accelerator. So a very different uh, design than uh, what we are used to today. Or another interface, uh, if we think about graphical interfaces and uh, touch screens. So here the context is extremely high tech, uh, very experimental. You know, you don't have a sense that this is already a very robust technology um, by any means. And of course, a lot has changed. So now this kind of uh, uh, touchscreen and graphical interface is something that any four-year-old can do in the back of a car, right? So from a very high-tech setting to a very mundane one, from very expert type of specialized tool to a very uh, everyday uh, self-evident uh, type of activity. So interfaces are really about uh, organizing interactions and the way they do this change. So that is what I want to highlight with these uh, particular historical uh, examples. And um, I want to connect this to knowledge because how we interface with data, how we interface with information um, really matters for our relationship uh, to knowledge. And that is what is nicely captured in this uh, quotation by Joanna Drucker, where she really uh, stresses that interfaces put us in mediating uh, relationship to knowledge. So I will let you ponder uh, this quotation. Um, and here I planned another pause uh, to see which questions are arising in my uh, setting forth of interfaces in this way. Uh, they quite contrast with the dictionary definition, for example, which is much more focused on device rather than the more practice oriented. So I'm curious which questions you have for me. You can use your mic and just um, ask the question, or you can use the chat box. Maybe I'm surprising everybody. People uh, were more expecting to, uh, you know, sit back and have the uh, yeah. end of afternoon uh, talk that they're uh, happily listening to. Maybe at the end, if they can reflect, uh, reflect their own interface with uh, your story. Okay. Oh yeah. Here's one question in the chat box. I've never thought about controlled uh, vocabularies as a kind of interface, so I don't have an articulate question framed. Is uh, one of the remarks. Yeah, okay. yeah indeed. Um, um, uh, controlled vocabularies uh, have an impact uh, on, for example, uh, approaches to searching. Uh, but they also end up uh, affecting how people characterize their work, right? The kind of metadata that they will use. So they kind of work in both directions, both for the users of the data, but also the producers of data. So indeed, they uh, mediate uh, the kinds of interactions that can be had with that. I don't know, Anna, whether you can see the uh, questions. Yes, I can. I uh, I see the chat uh, comments here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I see there's also a comment on the back end because um, indeed we do tend to think about uh, interfaces as you know the front end, the the front stage, uh, but interfaces also have uh, an impact on the back end. So some interfaces are very demanding uh, of uh, backend uh, capacities. And um, uh, ideally, interfaces are also uh, optimized to uh, be served well by their backend and vice versa. So there is a mutual shaping going on there as well. Sorry, Anne, I don't have articulate thoughts. I just have... Uh, um excitement about because I, I've never thought about this stuff this way so I'm quiet but I have thoughts and since you asked for thoughts <laughs> I've shared them 
Okay. And since you called me out by name, or not by name, but since you called me out as the historian, I felt by profession. Obliged. By profession, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, piping up, Jeremy. Appreciate it. And a question from, or a comment from Hendrik, and a question, uh, I think surprise is good, thank you. Um, what is your opinion on providing filtering information for non-experts? Uh, should we, uh, should data be truly open or should we limit access? Um, well, uh, I think that, um, uh, you know, openness is always a relative, term. So we may feel that things are very open, but of course, they're open in specific ways. Um, and I think that uh, also for experts, we should also reflect on how we are opening up data. So there are always particular circumstances, conditions, frame, framing conditions under which we make data open. So for example, we make data open after publication. Right. So even if we feel we're being very open, that's always relative to, you know, the way things were before or to uh, previous closed practices. So um, um, I think that for experts or uh, a, a wider range of users, we always need to make explicit to what extent and under what conditions we're making things open. I think that kind of reflection is uh, is important. Um, and um, uh, yeah, the risk of misinterpretation, I think uh, that is a very important sensibility. Uh, we also have a sense of responsibility for what we're putting out there. Um, and um, yeah, uh, maybe rather than limit access, I might plead for supporting access. So if we're aware of ways in which data might be misunderstood or misrepresented, then I would say, uh, is it possible to support access to decrease the likelihood that uh, data that is accessed would be used in those ways that we imagine as being or evaluate as being less responsible? So um, I think that would be uh, my uh, take on that. Uh, yeah, very concisely uh, put. Thank you, Hendrik, for uh, summarizing my long answer so uh, so nicely. Okay, so thanks for uh, those uh, those interactions. Um, let me move on to um, this idea of better in interfaces, which uh, was the provocation in my title. So better than what? Well, let me uh, start by saying, I think that we have very impoverished interfaces at this point. Um, and here I am mostly thinking about search as the dominant interface in our uh, interactions with data and information. So right now there is a, uh, a very strong presence of the search box approach for information retrieval and of course, um, you know, it has its place, it has its function, it's a very powerful paradigm. However, I think that we are um, really in a situation where we have too much of a monoculture, where uh, too much of data and information is accessed via the search box. Um, and this uh, has kind of come about through this lock-in. Um, it searches a dominant interface and interaction design since the emergence of the web. Um, and it has really, uh, you know, as I said, uh, the web is optimized uh, for search, right? Um, there's a, a very interesting book called uh, Search Culture, uh, which explains this at great length. So probably doesn't need illustrating, but just to be sure we're on the same page. Uh, these are the kinds of things that I uh, think of uh, when I say search. So the everyday uh, Google, of course, but also more uh, specialized or expert use, right? So looking for uh, clinical trial information or um, uh, other applications in uh, the medical domain. So I look for examples from health for today. 
So again, here we see uh, the search box as the main interface uh, to the data. So um, when we use search, that shapes our interaction with information in particular ways. Um, and this is a question that I uh, use very fruitfully with my students where I ask them to consider, you know, who does this interface think you are? So what does that say about the expectations uh, for information use to the kind of relationship you can have to information? And with search, the answer, well, um, you know, a search box thinks that you're a user who knows what they're looking for. So uh, we mentioned the uh, controlled vocabularies, right? So sets of keywords uh, that are common in the field uh, so that you know what it's called, right? So again, uh, the specific language with ser which search terms to use, um, but also what is enough, right? Uh, how specific does your query need to be in order to get significant results? So search may seem very neutral and very open as a search, uh, as a, a, an interface strategy, um, but it's actually already shaping in important ways uh, what you can know. So this is who the interface thinks you are. This is the kind of user uh, that is able to use search well. And it also assumes that you're going to be happy as a user, that you're going to be happy with the best match, right? Not most surprising match or um, uh, less likely match or most satisfying match, but you know, best match according to uh, this, this keyword type of logic. And it also assumes that you're uh, a user who doesn't want to engage with the complexity of the search space. Uh, the, uh, the list of hits um, only tells you what is there, but doesn't give you any information about what is not there or only very, very, very indirectly, right? So it assumes that uh, the list will satisfy your, um, your, your knowledge needs. Um, I uh, could say a little bit more, uh, maybe if, if uh, some of you are curious about it, there's some games uh, around search. So Google WAC uh, might be one that some of you know. Um, and when we think about those games, so how people try to subvert the logic of search, that also tells us something about kind of the limitations or the, the dominant understanding of search that gets mind or uh, becomes playful when people start uh, to do games with, uh, with search. Um, but the point is that even, uh, even though it may seem uh, a logical, obvious, simple, neutral to interact with knowledge, there are assumptions that are built into, uh, into an interface that is really focused on the search logic. So what else uh, you might be starting to think? Well, um, we already do things uh, that are not search when we're looking for information. So for example, uh, something called chaining, which is a very different strategy. So you're reading a paper, you see in the reference list, uh, something that is of interest that leads, takes you to another text, uh, which will also have a reference list, which might also take you to yet another uh, source. So that is the strategy called chaining. Um, it was also uh, more important in the early days of the web where hyperlinks were a very important way of navigating and discovering information on the web. Um, now that has been completely subsumed to search. Another one is uh, browsing. So we know this from physical libraries, uh, but also some online connections, collections uh, have interfaces that enable browsing. Um, there are also uh, richer interfaces than the search box that yields a list. And then you can start to think about things like um, uh, interfaces that foreground the collection rather than you know, putting it behind the very simple page with the box uh, or interfaces that present metadata and invite you to interact with that or um, that present different scales of data uh, right away from the interface uh, point. And, uh, you know, as I said, whereas um, the list of hits kind of hides the, uh, the search space, what might have been found was, was not found or what could not be found, 
um, it's possible to have interfaces that uh, actually increase your awareness of the search space. So again, uh, stressing that uh, interfaces are actually uh, uh, technologies that enable us to act in particular ways. I have this uh, quotation from um, Madeleine Akrich, uh, who uses this notion of script uh, inspired by film to think about how technologies, and in our case, interfaces might lead us towards uh, particular ways of interacting with, uh, with data. Okay, time for uh, a breath. And if uh, there's any pressing questions, uh, time for those as well. Yeah, there was, um, uh, during the last break, there was uh, yeah, a remark from Jeremy uh, when you started. So may maybe you already, you've already seen it, but he says, uh, so language in itself becomes an interface. And we have the, uh, in their, I don't even, I cannot even pronounce that word. In their term, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. But we, we have a translation problem, yeah. literally. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, maybe you can respond on that. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Esther, for uh, pointing me to that. Um, indeed, uh, we can also think about language as an interface. And um, I'm, I actually uh, just developed a course on interfaces here at uh, Campus Friesland, and. I, um, you know, this is also a discussion I had with the students when I taught this course for the first time last winter. Um, is everything an interface then? And then what is the value of the term, right? So if, if even language, if words uh, are interfaces. Um, and then I think I, I would point back to the definition that came up uh, a little earlier, where it's an organized space of interaction. So organized in the sense of, um, you know, there is some intention, uh, there might be repetition or knowledge of um, something being treated as an interface. So it is a relative concept. Uh, uh, you know, what is an interface for one thing will may not necessarily be an interface in another context. Um, and, you know, I do want the definition to be flexible to some extent. But I think that it's useful to uh, kind of hold on to that more um, sociological or that focus on uh, practice as being uh, a way to determine whether, you know, it's interface, whether we want to call something an interface in an interesting way without completely kind of multiplying uh, the, the number of cases uh, that can be interfaces. Yeah, so are people happy with uh, with what they search? And Ham is asking for uh, an example. Uh, and I'm very happy with both. Uh, Ham, uh, I have a, a very nice example uh, coming up in a minute. Um, and uh, to answer Hong's question about whether people are happy with uh, the way they search. Um, uh, yes, that is one way to look at it. Um, one thing that I have been exploring lately as I work on this topic is um, I, one of the tenets of uh, information interface design is that if you have more complexity or if you have, sorry, if you have more uncertainty, you increase the complexity and users don't like that. So that has been kind of the dominant idea, but I'm finding some very interesting work that actually shows that um, if you also show some of the uncertainty, if you convey some of the uncertainty to the user, yes, it does increase complexity, but it can also increase the quality of uh, the data. So for example, uh, if you're doing crowdsourcing and you enable people to have an interface where they can also input, you know, what is my level of certainty of the label that I'm attributing to this plant? Um, that you're then able to uh, have data that is actually of better quality. So that is one interesting dimension. And the other interesting dimension is that when you uh, make 
uncertainty part of the interface, you're actually also uh, creating conditions of increased trust. Uh, so that seems to also accompany uh, the inclusion of uncertainty. So um, I, I find these two lines of work very intriguing in terms of, um, uh, you know, the simplest is maybe not uh, always what uh, people are, are completely uh, looking for. Okay, and uh, Holm, uh, let me answer your question about um, uh, a way of uh, searching that is not a, uh, a search box. So as I said, in our group, uh, we want to make a difference. We want to intervene in the ways people are working. And uh, we've decided that we can do this best if we kind of focus uh, on specific areas because then it's uh, possible to, dis to establish relationship with uh, you know, the builders of databases and interfaces. And we're doing this in the area of climate and biodiversity. And for climate change, uh, I was talking about uh, showing uncertainty, showing the complexity. So that, those are really the issues that are coming up uh, in our work around climate change. Um, and we think that this will lead to more relevant knowledge and to better decision-making. Pardon me. Uh, and in terms of biodiversity, uh, we think that having interfaces that, that enrich our relationship to the world will actually lead to better coexistence between uh, species. So multi-species conviviality is, uh, is the complex word we've uh, come up with. That. Um, and more than human caring so that we will have a, a better relationship to our planet. So I want to show uh, an example, which is from biodiversity. And to make the case for better interfaces, I want to do this uh, by comparing two different uh, interfaces. So one that does have the search box and one that doesn't. So biodiversity, very briefly, is the estimation of uh, the number of species that occur in a given place. And this is based on records of observation. So such and such a species has been observed as such and such a place. Uh, and this is the, the term for this is an occurrence. So when you have a species at a specific place, that is an occurrence. And GBIF is uh, a huge well, global uh, repository for biodiversity information. Um, and it collects data from all kinds of sources. Uh, natural history museums are very important sources. So uh, like uh, Naturalis in Leiden or the Natural History Museum in, uh, in London, but also apps. So you may know some of them, um, uh, uh, varnaming.nl uh, is one. Another one is the iNaturalist uh, app. And this data of particular species having been observed in specific places uh, is uh, validated and taken up in uh, GBIF. Now, uh, here you see the box. So that is the search uh, uh, interface uh, to GBIF. And uh, what you see in the, in the larger column uh, is a table. So the list of, uh, of the results of the search. Now, GBIF also has uh, different, uh, different possibilities for interfaces. So, for example, you can also uh, have the gallery presentation of results, which looks something like this, uh, where you see the results of your search. And here, GBIF really emphasizes um, the, the specific species, so the different species that uh, are retrieved by your search, and they really present them as, specific, as um, separate units, so different items in the table, or here different photographs with different labels, so separate elements that are the outcome of your search. So, you know, uh, so what? Um, I think the contrast becomes more uh, evident if we compare it to a different interface. So this is a project called Local Kin, uh, and it's an animated and very layered interface. Let me take you through the different layers. So on um, the left-hand side, you see kind of white uh, spots on a grayish background. That is the um, 
geophysical context for the data and the light points indicate where there are uh, data points. So where there are more observations, there is a, an area of more uh, light gray. So the density of observation is indicated here. Then there's a seasonal dial, and I'm afraid you might not be able to see it very well. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a small, you know, imagine a clock face, which has a, a sun and a, uh, for summer and a snowflake for winter. And there is a little dial, a little dot that is going around. And that is the animation because the data then gets presented according to whether it's data uh, observations from summertime or observations from winter time. So you see that changing uh, gently as the, the dial rotates. It then presents the data as a photographic mosaic. So the kind of oval shapes you see within the big circle, those are the, the, the photographs of the species that have been observed. And then uh, the list of circles down in the lower half of uh, the interface, that is then the list of occurrences. So I can't show you the animation, but to give you a sense of the difference, uh, I did a screen grab of wintertime and of summertime. So then you see that there is a difference in uh, the temporal distribution. Um, and you see the seasonal variation in the species and uh, in the human observations. And what I also think is very interesting about this, uh, this interface, and here I've picked an example where this really comes out very uh, strikingly, the white space, right? So there is actually one photo in the mosaic. It's, it, there is one species observed at that particular space at that particular time. Um, which, uh, you know, also highlights the incompleteness of the record. Um, so the fact that we do not have all the data uh, is something that is put forth here. So on this slide, um, I compare the two interfaces a little bit more systematically. And um, what I think is especially interesting to note is that they are based on exactly the same kind of data. Right, the same kinds of records are feeding the two interfaces. So they're both based on occurrence records. But whereas GBIF is really species uh, focused and highlights single units, so where is one specific uh, species found when and where, this mosaic where uh, you have this integration of the different records where they, they're kind of merging visually um, actually stresses the co-occurrence of species. The fact that in that particular spot at that particular time, these species are co-present and uh, coexisting. The fact that it's an animation also highlights the temporal distribution so that there's a, a very important uh, seasonal effect uh, for species. And uh, the human observations are also partial, but also affected by you know, particular locations. So on the beach in summertime, there are many more observations than wintertime, for example. So um, then this also highlights uh, the conditions of production of the data. So I think it's important uh, to, to have these kinds of elements that give a sense of the production of the data, the relation to observation, a more reflexive approach to uh, data, um, but also of the importance of relationships between different species, which is, of course, uh, extremely important as we try to protect ecosystems. So, Han, I'm curious whether this uh, example uh, helped make things a bit more concrete uh, and what you're curious about uh, in terms of interfaces that might look different uh, from searches. And, of course, I'm curious if other people have uh, questions as well. Well, if I can answer my microphone, um, I, well, I just found it hard to imagine a search without a search box. So that's also why yeah. I was very interested in seeing an example. I can totally understand why this way of visualization helps a lot. Also, I think in search space in essence, because it shows like the incompleteness. Because like for me as a currently a master, someone who's a master student, I do a lot of research, so finding papers and such. And I um, definitely run into the feeling of being like, I cannot know how complete this data is. 
or you know because i look into a database or google scholar or whatever place i search in and i get some top hits but i can't read every paper of course and um, metadata is not always reliable or complete so yeah i just think that's really interesting but i do wonder how for example visualization like this would work for something as non-visual as research papers and finding that kind of information. Yeah, um, uh, indeed, uh, I completely agree with you. I think we need to like spark our imagination, train our imaginations to, uh, to be more aware. Um, and I'd be curious if maybe in the coming days um, you will actually uh, start to notice uh, the exception, right? When you're not confronted with a search uh, box and you think like, oh, okay, this is something a little different. Um, here is a little bit of, uh, of variation. Um, but indeed it is hard to imagine because of this monoculture, because uh, we have become so trained and literate in uh, approaching data from the search box uh, approach. Yeah, there was also a question from uh, Frank, uh, actually two questions. Um, yeah, regarding the databases, so uh, aren't people happy with the way they search? So, do you know anything about um, yeah the, the uh, satisfaction of people with how they search at this moment? And also the yeah. second question: <coughs> Aren't we spoiled with Google-like interfaces? Yeah, yeah, the the junk food of interfaces. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, indeed, for a long time, um, there was a feeling that what people wanted was, uh, you know, simple, easy, uh, and that is also why I highlighted that um, increased complexity can actually uh, lead to more more trust or to higher quality uh, of the data. There's some interesting work that is uh, emerging that uh, that stresses this. Um, and, uh, I, I think that, um, you know, at times it may feel like when, when we're faced with other types of interfaces, it may feel like, okay, now, you know, we have to eat our vegetables. Uh, it, this is a, a little bit harder work. It's a little, a little bit, it goes down a little bit less easy, um, than what we're used to. Um, but on the other hand, we may also find that, uh, we uh, get more pleasure or more curiosity from being uh, engaged with the different interfaces or um, that people who actually are not uh, stimulated by search or do not have uh, the knowledge of the vocabularies and the terms and the search strategies um, uh, who, who don't have that kind of search engine literacy or search box literacy, um, other people might find other uh, interfaces easier to use and that that might actually diversify the kinds of users that we have for our data. So other people might have uh, other groups than experts might have other affinities with uh, with uh, other search approaches or other information uh, interaction uh, approaches. Okay. And we have about uh, five minutes uh, left for the presentation. Okay, so let me uh, just end. I, I just have two more slides, uh, and they're they're a bit busy uh, because I wanted to share with you all the different uh, ways in which I'm thinking we can take this uh, forward. Um, the first one, maybe a bit of a cliche, but here I mean it very literally that we need to get out of the search box. Um, that uh, if we explore different logics beyond best match, we might actually find different ways that our data is, uh, is valuable. Um, and uh, I, I really think that there's a whole unexplored potential of digital data uh, that can go beyond search, retrieval, and computation. So highlighting you know, objects, uh, uh, relations rather than objects, right? So the species living together rather than the separate species, uh, topologies rather than location, and uh, what I call possibility and potential rather than calculation. So if we have to imagine different futures for our way of living uh, on this planet, um, maybe we need more speculative types of uh, information interaction. 
I think that uh, we can get inspiration from the digital humanities and critical design. Um, and I think I saw that uh, Veronica Jonsson uh, was joining us for some of the time and her work has been really inspirational uh, to me for uh, some of these explorations. And uh, as Frank already foreshadowed, it won't be easy. Uh, we will have to fight the Tinas. Those are the people who say that there is no alternative, uh, Tinas for short. And they are having good exemplars can help, right? Having like some, some nice cases you can use to make your argument. Um, there are material consequences. So right now, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the web is optimized for, you know, for search. And uh, as designers and programmers, you'll need different skills, maybe different composition of teams. But also as users, uh, we will have to, you know, spend a little, invest a little bit of time in uh, figuring out how these interfaces work. Um, what we call intuitive designs are, are actually just familiar designs, but hopefully that will be compensated by more engagement, more uh, curiosity, and um, you know, discovery uh, and, and attachment perhaps to uh, to the knowledge practices that we're developing. And of course, the hope coming back to the really big questions I started out with um, is that we will have uh, a different kind of knowledge that can help us better address uh, these very, very challenging and difficult questions we're, uh, we're facing. So luckily I'm uh, not doing this on my own. So I wanna end with uh, a thank you, a shout out to my uh, wonderful colleagues uh, at uh, Campus Friesland. And uh, maybe for the sake of discussion, I can go back to uh, some of these uh, long uh, lists of bullet points uh, and we can take a couple minutes to discuss those further. So thanks a lot for your attention. Yeah, thank you. So if there are any questions, please use your mic again, put it in the chat box. It can be about this slide, but also about the presentation in general. And I, I was wondering myself if you look at um, uh, because you you explained that there are many um, uh, search boxes that are not, yeah not very uh, objective or not always objective. Uh, but I was wondering if you make it visible what happens. Uh, so if you use the same search box and the same results, but as as a user you can at least see what happens and what the decisions are. Would that help? Yeah, I think that uh, would go some way in kind of enriching uh, our understanding of, you know, what we're doing with, uh, with data. Um, I do think, however, that that's not radical enough. Uh, I think we need to go a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper into um, how, um, yeah, how, how we interface uh, with knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe to follow up, I can pick up on uh, the question by Karina Suliem about how this could be applied in public health care. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, let's, uh, one, one, thinking out loud, uh, one, I, one thing that comes to mind is um, if you are asking patients to report uh, on uh, their experiences or their symptoms, um, again, these kinds of interfaces tend to be uh, quite rigid, uh, to be uh, forced menus where you don't have a lot of flexibility to report on, uh, you know, your lived experience as a patient. So maybe there would be ways to design those uh, interfaces so that um, the, the data that can be elicited and shared by patients might be richer. Um, and uh, not confined to, you know, very strict, uh, disciplined um, types of interfaces. So maybe that that is one context where you might think, okay, um, uh, more flexibility, more complexity will also enrich our uh, our knowledge base as uh, medical experts. So that's one uh, case that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you much, very much, uh, and I think this was a very interesting uh, talk. Only, yeah, only it feels like it's only the beginning of the problem. So it's much bigger, of course, than than we could discuss in this uh, this hour. 
um, but um, your message is clear. Yeah. Uh, I will go to, let me see the last slide of this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. really so thank you. Yeah. Thank you for uh, going through the credits because then uh, they're part of the video. So I mentioned uh, Veronica Johansson's work that I use also in my teaching, but mm -hmm. uh, this talk was inspired by a lot of other people and I'm glad that the credits have also uh, come up. Yeah, thank you very much. And my apologies for not pronouncing your name uh, correctly at the beginning. So um, uh, for all the listeners, thank you for being here. It was really nice to have this interactive discussion. Uh, but I would like to suggest uh, the next meeting, please put it in your calendar, the 17th of November, the Desk Sparkle event, AI and Robotics. So you're all welcome to come back the 17th of November. Thank you. Thank you very much also for all the questions and this wonderful opportunity.